Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. It's really good to be back here. Hey, man. Good to see you. Um, I know I haven't met all of you, um, but uh, I moved to Hollister, if anybody was wondering. <laughs> but uh, it's a blessing being back here with you guys. Uh, we really enjoyed our time here, uh, meeting all of you. I just remember this church was so kind to us, so loving. It really made us feel like family. And that's why we kept coming here. Is this working? Mm hmm. We can, oh. hear, we can hear you. Yeah. All right. Did you guys have a good Thanksgiving? Amen. amen. We have a lot to be thankful for. Amen. amen. Thankful for all that rain. Um, you know, in July of this year, I had the opportunity to go to the beautiful country of Belize. Amen. <laughs> Is anybody here from Belize? Amen. amen. <laughs> Brother Jesus. Um, yeah, Belize is an amazing country. You know, it's very friendly, it's very safe, and it's in Central America. Um, I have some friends down there, and they have a lot of property, and they're exploring the idea, the possibility of growing food and selling it. They want to have uh, fruit orchards, they want to see what they can grow down there. And, uh, you know, I'm used to growing up here, if anybody doesn't know. Um, decided I had this crazy idea that I would be an organic farmer a couple years back and uh, I brought my family on this journey uh, ever since we moved from Bakersfield to Fresno Amen. to learn how to grow food and sell it. Um, I started out I wanted to uh, grow uh, food to eat in the garden and I loved it so much I thought why not just see if we can do this as a living as a small family. I heard people were doing it. So I was used to growing in our climate here in California. So I went down to Belize, and it's just completely different. It's tropical. So, uh, you know, they, my friends, they paid for my plane ticket. I was very grateful. Um, I went north, I went south in the country, I went east, and I was trying to visit as many places and gather as much information as I could about how to grow, uh, how to farm in Belize. And that's actually, you know, uh, Belize, that's actually their number one uh, way that the country makes money. Is economy. Food. Yeah, for their economy. And that's amazing. Um, and uh, a really cool thing about Belize is their public transportation. They have this one main road that runs north and south. And then they have uh, another highway that goes uh, east and west, more or less. And uh, I love riding the public transportation. It's a bus, is what it is. And it's uh, really inexpensive. Uh, all the locals use it. Um, and it's a great way to sit down next to people and meet new people. Right? And for the most part, I kind of look Belizean, more or less. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a mixture of people, it that's is, why. It's a mixture. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of different kinds of people there. It's a melting pot. It's really amazing. Um, but I, 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 could look, I could definitely pass for a Belizean. Um, so as long as I don't open my mouth, people can just assume that I'm Belizean. They actually speak English there. Yeah. Which is actually pretty amazing too if you want to go visit. Um, but as long as I just keep quiet, that nobody knows, nobody is going to look at me funny. Um, but, uh, you know, I was praying. I was saying, God, is there anybody that I could talk to on these bus rides? Because I was traveling all over the country. Um, is there anybody that I could talk to? So I had some really nice conversations with people. But I remember it was a couple of days just before I was uh, going to leave. I had maybe three or four days. It was just before my last weekend there. Um, and I took a bus ride from Belize City. I was at an agriculture conference there. And uh, I was going to head towards, uh, I was going to head west. I was going to head towards Balmopan. And That's the capital. The capital, yeah. And uh, I remember the bus wasn't particularly full, which is good, because normally it is. Um, and the seat next to me was empty. And just before we left the city, you know, the, the buses make their rounds, picking up people along the way out. And uh, just before we left the city, we stopped, and this gentleman walks on the bus wearing a uniform, a police uniform. It wasn't just any police uniform. He looked like he had some distinguishment. He looked uh, like he had some rank, I guess you could say. And he carried himself like a military man. And uh, he looked kind of intimidating to me. And so lo and behold, he walks down the aisle of the bus, and here he comes. And he sits right next to me. And I'm just like, okay, 
I'm going to be late. Um, and so, I, I mean, just straight posture, very clean cut guy. And so after a few minutes we're driving, and I noticed he pulled out his iPad. And then I just happened to glance over and I see he's reading uh, the Bible. He's reading, uh, I think it was maybe the book of Acts. And so I start praying, I'm like, wow, oh, God, this guy's reading the Bible, this is really cool, we have something in common. And he's, I'm gonna try and, uh, can I, you know, is this your will, is this providence? You know, so I, I, I start praying, and I'm really nervous, and I'm like, okay, I'll talk to this guy. I'll talk to him. Don't be scared. Um, so I start talking, and oh, so I, you know, I say hi, introduce myself, and uh, he's, he says hi, you know, and oh, nice to meet you, and uh, so I tell him, oh, you know, I'm, uh, I noticed you're reading the Bible. I also read the Bible. Um, what book are you reading? And so he tells me, and we start having this conversation about, you know, the Bible and uh, some books that he's reading. And so I'm wondering, okay, did he have any of this in the word? Because what he's saying, as the conversation goes on, it really starts to touch my heart. And I've been, I was praying to God, Lord, what do you want me to say to this man? But as I listen to this man talk to me, I start becoming more and more blown away, in a good way, that what he was saying to me he was basically telling me the assurity of the love of Christ for me. And he said it with such conviction and such fervor that he knew that this man believed what he said. And it was the Holy Spirit that was moving upon my heart through the words of this man to me about the assurity and the love of Jesus and the assurity I have in his forgiveness my life. And I just didn't know what to say. After a while, as the conversation got more and more, I just got more and more quiet. And I was just thinking. And I realized that this was something that I needed. And so, you know, by this time, I'm wondering, is this guy Adventist? And then, of course, as the conversation goes on, you know, I realize uh, he's, he's not Adventist. But we became good friends. Uh, we exchanged information. We emailed each other a few times after. And Lord willing, you know, I want to, you know, continue, uh, Lord willing, I'll see him again to go to mm -hmm. Belize. Um, it's kind of a small country. It's not too hard to find somebody. Yeah. He's the, he was, it turns out he's the captain, or one of the captains at the uh, police station in Belize City. Really nice man, really godly. And the gods really put somebody that's really godly in charge over there of, of the police station. Um, and that really uh, said something to me. But, you know, I was just really taken back. And I realized, God, you know, I... I had knowledge at this time, you know, when I was at this place. You know, I had knowledge, and I thought I wanted to share some truths with him, some truth. Um, but Lord, really, I feel like I was convicted. I'll tell you the truth. If I wasn't a Christian, and I was listening to this man there on that bus, I would have been like, I'm converted. Who is this Jesus? How does he love me so much? How did he know? It's like, and he was using the Bible, too. Um... But it's actually not what I'm going to talk to you guys about today. But it does have so much to do with it. Uh, I'm a farmer. Bless my thoughts and my mind, God, and that you'll please help us, Lord, all to come away from this, Lord, feeling more and more love. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm a farmer, and I'm going to talk to you about some farming things, growing things. I'm not going to get complicated. Um, but uh, let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, and verse 8. Genesis chapter 2, and verse 8. Say amen when you're there. 
Amen. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Let's skip down to verse uh, 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So here you have God. He just created uh, the whole planet, right? And on the uh, sixth day, he makes man, right? And what's the first job? You have a perfect God making a perfect world before sin, before anything enters the world. And the first job, or occupation, I guess you could call it, that he gave man to do is what? It says in verse 15, to tend it, or to dress it, in the King James, to tend it and to keep it, take care of it. But God planted the garden. God planted it, and it was man's job to take care of it. Right? Amen. Now, let's go to one chapter over. Let's go to chapter 3. Chapter 3, and let's start at verse 17. And this is just after Adam and Eve had just eaten after the fruit. And they hid from God, and God found them. And this is what God says to Adam. In verse 17, chapter 3, 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, curse is the ground for your sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Verse 18, thorns also and thistles shall bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So, God, in all his wisdom, puts man in charge of the garden. And then, in his wisdom, after sin comes, he says, now the ground is going to be cursed. And now, you're not just going to tend it and take care of it. Now, it's going to be hard. You're going to have to work at it. If you want food, if you want to eat. How many of you guys cried when you had your bowl of oatmeal this morning? Or did you guys, was it really, <laughs> I guess, uh, well, I might have cried. Depends on how tasty it was. I don't know. Um, but uh, why did God do that? Why? Let's read verse 17 one more time. One more time. Uh, halfway down. Curse is the ground for... Your sake. For thy sake? For your sake. So if I tell you, for thy sake, what does that usually mean? For your benefit. For your benefit. Very good. For your good. For your benefit. For your good. So, and in verse 19, let's read 19 real quick one more time. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till you return unto the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So, the Bible doesn't just come out and say this. But here's the thing. You know, when, uh, in creation, I like to imagine, um, I like to imagine that God created the garden, and then he's there with Adam, and he's teaching him how to take care of these plants in this world that he created. But then I also like to imagine God not showing Adam everything. I like to imagine God leaving lessons in creation about who God is and about who his character is. Little lessons. And I tell you, you know, when I started farming, I told you guys I wanted to make money at it, right? And so I went to a farm that's also a business, and I apprenticed there. And uh, one thing that I was not expecting was just how real these lessons are. I wasn't expecting the effect that growing food would have on my character and on my heart. And I was blown away by that. I was like, wow, this is amazing, God. It's like you just can't help but see it. So here you have God forms man out of the dust. All right, see if you can connect these dots with me. Sin enters now man. And also, now sin enters the ground. And man, God formed from the ground. You see what I'm talking about here? 
So we're going to be talking about soil. We're going to be talking about plants. A lot about soil. Uh, a lot about ground, about earth. But we're also talking about us. We're talking about our hearts here. And I really believe that's what God intended when he said, now it's going to be so much harder to work this earth. But it doesn't stop there. There's so much more hope. It's not like God just did it vindictively. He said it's for our sake. It's for us. And I, we believe God is loving. Amen. Then we have to believe also that this is what something he did out of his love for us. Amen? Amen. All right. Joe, can you put up that first picture, Ellie? All right. So I moved to Hollister. When you guys, everybody ever, ever passed through Hollister before? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What do you guys see when you pass through Hollister? Yeah. Gilroy Hollister? A lot of farming stuff. A lot of farming stuff. A lot of stuff. I mean, like around here also, right? But for some reason, I always hear people say, um, I always hear people talk about Hollister. Oh, man, the soil there is so good. Salinas Valley, you know, it's just so rich. And rightly so, if you look at most fertile places, if you Google search it um, in, in the US, here in California, and specifically around that area, around the San Andreas Fault, uh, they say it's extremely fertile, right? A lot of potential. So we go to Hollister, uh, it's my uncle's property, and uh, this is just a corner of it. We're working maybe about a quarter acre, something like that. Um, something that a small family can take care of, and also that can support a small fi family financially. Um, but this is just one corner of it. Um, so I thought, man, this soil is going to be awesome, right? We took a soil test, and it said potentially it could be. Um, and then so the day came, I got my tools, I got a shovel, and I slammed it into the ground, and then beep, just ricocheted right off. Which is what I figured. It looked like it was really hard, um, but I was just testing it. So I got a pick, uh, you know, like a big eight-pound pick, you know, like a, a miner's pick, right? So I grabbed it. And I brought it up and I took it down, and it went in about an inch or so, which is what I was assuming was going to happen. I didn't know it was this bad, right? I mean, you're walking on it and you're trying to dig, your, you want to see how your tools are going to do, and I'm like, oh wow, this is pretty bad. Um, so I had this big old broad fork, uh, you'll see a picture of it later, um, but the big old broad fork is made out of iron, has two hands. Imagine a giant pitchfork that's meant for digging, except it has two bars. And you basically, it's really heavy. It's not used for hay, it's not a pitchfork. But it has tines at the end, like a pitchfork, and you slam it into the ground, and you should be able to wiggle it down deeper. So instead of brute force, you're kind of trying to ease it in. And so it would hardly go in the ground, and when I pulled it back, it's supposed to lift up dirt. But all I got was a bunch of hard clods of dirt, okay? And so my cousin's there, and I pick up one of these claws, and he's like, wow, there's rocks in our dirt? I'm like, dude, this is dirt. <laughs> this is your dirt. You, we couldn't break it up. It was solid rock. Has anybody, has it, has anybody ever gardened before? You guys garden? Some of you? Um, you know what? There's nothing different about this soil from the majority of soils that I've ever seen here in California. When I lived in Bakersfield, we had uh, earth there, too. We had, uh, I tried gardening in our backyard. And uh, the ground, I thought I was cursed. I was like, God, here I am trying to grow stuff, and I have the worst soil in all of California. And uh, sure enough, everywhere I've gone in California, with varying degrees, is pretty hard to work. Um, and I've just gotten used to it. This wasn't surprising to me, but I was, I was a little bit surprised at how hard it was because for the area, because I've heard. And I pass by all these farms, and it looks like the soil is just so fluffy and light, and I can't figure it out. So, basically, uh, can you go to the next slide? I had done some reading, and I decided, okay, well, we're going to, of course, wet the ground. And I, rec I heard, you know, let's wet it for a couple hours. Let's wet it for hours. And those sprinklers there aren't just any sprinklers, they're, uh, they're designed for, for farms, and so they let out high gallons per minute, so we didn't want to run a huge water bill. Um, but um, we, we ran it for like maybe three or four hours. And so I came back after it was finished, and I took the broad fork again, stabbed it, worked it a little bit, pulled it back, and the water had only penetrated maybe about two or three inches. It's, it's like underneath that, all of a sudden, it's just rock hard. Really dense soil. It was dense, 
high clay content, I guess. Um, and so, man, we're going to have to wet this even longer. So we left it on all day. And then we finally shut it off at night. And then after that, you see that, those black tarps over there? Well, we're doing this one section at a time. Uh, we can't wet all, or, all the whole area all at once. So we're doing one section at a time. So we wet it, and we put these black tarps in there. Um, and we did that so that the moisture wouldn't evaporate. We wanted to keep off. it there. <laughs> we wanted to saturate it. Um, you know, that soil, that first picture, can you go back to the first picture real quick? That soil, <clears throat> that soil right there has tremendous potential, but that soil right there is dead. Biologically, that soil is dead because for there to be biology in the soil or life in the soil, there has to be two things, moisture and warmth. Those are the only two things that biology really needs to start to thrive. If you can give, bio, if you can give moisture to the soil and also warmth, all of a sudden the bacteria and the fungi start to spread and grow and it gives life. Why is that important? Well, when you go to school, you know they teach you what, how do plants get nutrients, right? The, it sprouts, the roots grow, they take up nutrients from the soil, and then they get bigger, right? But they're actually leaving out a step. Actually, mm -hmm. science shows what's actually going on is the roots of that plant, that plant is letting out sugars into the soil. And the sugar is right around the area of the root, microscopically. And what that plant is trying to do is promote biology in the soil around the root. Because by itself, that plant can't take up any kind of any nutrients from the soil. It needs bacteria and fungi and other microorganisms to digest the soil. And then it gives it basically the bacteria and all this life, they let out, um, they excrete the nutrients in a form that the plant can take up. So there has to be life in the soil. If the soil has no water, it has no life. Okay? With me so far? All right. So that's about as technical as we're going to get. All right? Um, but uh, let's go ahead and go to the next picture, Joe. Thank you. Cool. All right. So we left it on there for maybe two or three weeks. Okay? These tarps. And I lifted it up, and I'd see worms in there all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like, well, they, they, they liked that environment for one, but also it's like, I would never imagine a worm could live in that hard, dense soil. But I was amazed. I was like, wow, there's only worms there already. And so I covered it back up and we waited until finally we were taking off the tarp little by little and we started working the soil. No tractors here. This is, uh, we're, we're doing this kind of no-till, low-till. Um, and also I'm trying to experiment. I want to see if it can be done with as little equipment as possible, in case anybody wanted to try it. Um, but you look on the left, all of a sudden the soil is so easy to work. It's amazing. And on the, on, the, on the right side, that's actually already a finished product. If I took out a scoop there, it would be light and fluffy. And on the left, we're still working it. And it's just broken up. And it's just so much easier. It was a joy to work this soil. And I was amazed. I was actually blown away at how well the water worked. Um, let's go one more picture. All right. So, and that's the broad fork there on the left. And we're, we're continuing to do this uh, one step at a time, one section at a time. Um, but it's really amazing. And my question is to you, what made the difference there? It was the moisture. It was the water. Right? It was the water. Not just a little bit of water. We had to water it a lot. We had to get that water down. Because we wanted roots. I mean, you know, some plants are sent down a big tap root, but we need, we, uh, ideally, at least 10 to 12 inches of good quality, you know, workable soil for these plants to start. Um, and so that was the problem. We couldn't just have a surface cultivation. We couldn't just have, like, three, four, five inches. We needed a lot more of workable, moist soil if we were going to try to be successful in planting anything here. Okay? Um, and so we needed to water it a lot. Um, 
Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 4, the book of John. The Gospel of John chapter 4, when you're there, please say Amen. Amen. I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So Jesus says he gives the living water. Let's go uh, two more chapters over. Let's go to chapter 6. John chapter 6, and verse 63. There, say amen. 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 All right, verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth or gives life. Another word for quickeneth. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Let's do one more verse. Let's go to Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. In chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. <clears throat> For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I like the New King James Version. It says, For the word of God is living and powerful. What was the first verse we read? Jesus says that he gives this living water. That's what he said to the woman. And the second verse, John chapter 6, what did it say? That it is the spirit that gives life. Interesting. And then here in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, for the word of God is living. It's very interesting. So Jesus the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, and the Word of God are all connected. They really are. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God. You know, um, sometimes... teach these classes. I teach, you know, gardening classes every now and then. I did two last year, and this, this spring, hopefully, Lord willing, and also we're going to try again. I really want to teach people more about how to grow food. Uh, that's what interests me. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of confusion, I guess, about, um, about what, what they need, what, what their soil is. People look at their soil, and they're like, uh, I'm assuming it's like looking at this, and they're like, "Man, I need some. I need new soil. I need something way different here." Because I hear questions like, uh, "Like for example, when I was here in Fresno, somebody said, um, you know what? Should I go to Should I go to Salinas and get some of that some of that soil over there?'" This person really said this, and should I bring it in? And I hear people say very similar things to that. You know, should we bring in topsoil? A lot of this topsoil stuff. Um, but the thing is, it's not so much the soil. It's not so much this cursed soil. We all have cursed soil on planet Earth. That's just the way it is. Some people have better soil. But I would tell you, all soil has tremendous potential. Tremendous potential to be high in nutrients for the plants and also to be high in life. It's just how 
we're working in, or what the methods are. Okay, now let's take that, let's, let's talk spiritual here. I said, okay, we're talking about farming here, but if the original way that God had intended us to live still holds true, we can say that yes, this is, this is the laws of, of nature, the way the laws of the world work. We have cursed ground, but it doesn't matter what the soil is if we are able to work it. <coughs> Anything's possible. Amen? Amen? Amen. Okay. So the amazing thing is, you can't water yourself. You cannot turn on a faucet and make the soil of your heart moist enough. What do you need to make the soil of that hard heart moist enough to be good? Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a beautiful thing. If I could, I would have all of you guys work on a farm for just one season. I would say every Adventist should just spend one growing season on a farm. Just take a sabbatical from their job and just do spring to fall and just see what it's like because it's so beautiful. And I, was, I did not talk this way. I asked my wife, I did not talk like this before I became a farmer. I, I mean, I like gardening and everything, but I, I started doing this full time and I was like, this is amazing. God, you're telling me? This, it gave me so much confidence to see this beautiful illustration. That God, you're telling me you are the farmer. God, you're the farmer, and I need this soil. And you are trying to work my heart. You're trying to make me. You're trying to change me. And God doesn't just say, I need something, I need a fresh canvas to work with, I need something different, this is too much for me. He doesn't say, let's bring in some new soul, I want something different. He says, I have the ability to work in your life. Not only that, um, you know, when I first started out, I remember I would sit in the middle of a field and just be beside myself and just be like, God, this is so hard, I can't do this. Um, but the amazing thing is, you learn and you grow. You grow as a person, and you get better. And God is like the greatest farmer, the best farmer, the all-knowing farmer, the farmer that, I mean, that created what it is to grow. God knows exactly how to grow you. You know, what's the one thing that we all want in our life? I see multiple, I would say multiple things. When I really boil it down and I think about, God, what do I want from you? Or what I want you to do in my life is I want love, joy, right? I want love and joy to express with my family. I want peace and happiness. I want to be patient. I want the Holy Spirit. I want faith. I want all of these beautiful things. And what are those things that I just said? Fruits fruit of the Spirit. Spirit. God says that He will give us these things. What are fruits? Fruits come from a what? Tree. A tree, or a plant, any plant, or a plant for that matter. You could argue, I mean, you could argue that, I mean, black, blueberries, blackberries, you could argue that a tomato is a fruit, zucchini. Technically, if it flowers and it, it see. gives offspring after the flower, it's a fruit. Um, but if I were to put a seed in the soil when it was, when the soil wasn't ready, would that seed do very well? I've, I've been very impatient before when I first started. And I just wanted to get it done. I had so much to do. I said, oh man, let's just work this real quick. Let's do it. And then I put the seed in the ground, or I'll put the plant in the ground. And uh, sure enough, uh, the way God intended it, uh, nature you know, has an amazing cause and effect law. Um, you reap what you sow. The word, the Bible is just filled with this kind of language. You reap what you sow. I put this seed in when it wasn't time to, when I shouldn't have, when the soul wasn't prepared for it. Uh, thinking, man, this thing will grow anyway. It grew, but it did so poorly. Mm -hmm. And if I had just taken my time, and if I had just worked the soil right, it's an amazing thing. Um, and so it's really taught me, Matt, just take your time and just do it right. And I've learned that about God, is that I want stuff to happen so fast in my life. You guys ever felt that way? Mm -hmm. uh, but we live in a 
culture these days, so far removed from agrarian lifestyle, even though we're surrounded by farms, right? Um, but we are so far removed, and especially our young people. We, um, you know, we live in a now kind of culture, especially here in the U.S. Um, you know, it's like, think, think about it for a second. If you wanted to, to communicate with somebody just one state over, you have to, before, you would either have to travel and walk by word of mouth, or you'd send letters, maybe, right? But think about how long that took, even just to travel. But now, look at how quick everything is, instantaneously. Can you imagine having to wait months to, to hear from somebody that you love? But now it's so quick, and that's a blessing. I'm not saying we should go backwards. Um, but we're just so used to getting things what we want and what we need right now that we forgot about the way God had originally intended the world. Think about all the seasons. And think about time. Do plants grow very quickly? It takes time. It takes time to grow. And the amazing thing is they do grow, but it takes time. And it takes patience. And we're not, we're just not that used to it. But the amazing thing is God knows what he's doing. Amen? God knows what he's doing. Um, let me see here. Joe, can you put that last, that last stuff? Um, you guys, does that, does that seed look familiar to anybody? I guess it, it kind of could look like almost any seed. Um, it's not a mustard seed. Um, I'm sure there's smaller mustard seeds than I've seen. The mustard seeds I've seen are actually bigger than this. This is a really small seed. This is even smaller than a sesame seed. That's actually um, a cherry tomato seed. That's what it is. And you know, when I worked here in Fresno, one of my favorite things to grow was the cherry tomato plant. We had a lot of cherry tomatoes. Uh, we had a whole greenhouse for them, actually. I really liked growing them. Um, but, you know, I had the opportunity to plan a whole year of growing, and it was all up to me. So I planned it out, you know, I took all my experience that I had learned, and I wrote it down, I budgeted, I figured out how much it was going to cost, and when things needed to go on the ground, when the seed needed to be started variety of the cherries that I wanted, and I ordered them, and they came in the mail, and they, they got there, and uh, you know, the day came when it was time to start planting, and I was geeking out, and I was so excited, I was like, oh yes, let's do this, and I mean, if you want somebody excited about starting seeds, it's me, um, and it was hard for people to relate to that, but uh, so, I put so much energy into this, and I was excited, so I was sitting down at the table, and that, that behind it, you see there's trays. So we start them in these little plug flats until they get big enough to put in the ground. And uh, so I'm here with these tiny little seeds in my hand. And I'm picking them up one at a time. And I'm putting them in each one seed in each cell of these trays. And we're planting hundreds of these things. And I'm just taking my time. And I just remember thinking to myself, as I'm looking at this little seed, I just remember thinking, wow, I am so dependent this little tiny thing for my financial livelihood for the next, well, for this, this entire year. I was so dependent on this little tiny thing. And I was just standing there thinking about it. And it was like the Holy Spirit came up and whispered in my ear and revealed something to me. That meant, you see how you feel about this little seed? That is in stark contrast to how you feel about me, about my word in your life. And I realized I don't look at the word of God and about my relationship with Jesus like I did with the little tiny seed. Like I, if, if I could say that, I would say it's like, it's like saying I am so dependent on this to journey in my heart, in the soil of my heart, to grow to maturity and to produce good fruit, I don't say that. And it's like God was trying to say, trying to reveal this to me. And I had 
to say, God, you're right. You're absolutely right, God. I don't. I don't do that. Um, turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. This is one of my favorite verses. Um, one of my favorite verses ever. When I read it, I've read, I read this verse so many times. Um, but you know, when something is ripe to germinate in your heart, a piece of truth, a seed of truth, when it really strikes true, it really means a lot to you. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And... Uh, Chapter 3 and verse 11. So you know what uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 is, right? There's a time for everything, right? Verses 1 through, I think, 9 says, you know, there's a time. There's a, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to plant. And it goes on and on. And uh, right down to verse 11 says, he, being God, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has set the world in their hearts. In the New King James, it says, he has put heaven in their hearts, so that no man can find out the work that God does from beginning to the end. Do we know the work that God does from beginning to end? What does the word of God say? We don't. God is doing a work from beginning to him. What was your beginning? What's your birthday? That was your beginning. But even before then, the Bible says that God knew you. Remember how we were talking about those seeds and about watering that heart, about those things and about what that water is? What is the water? It's Jesus, the Holy Spirit. It's the word of God, right? We need the word of God. And more than that, we need to believe it. Um, back to when I was on that bus with that man, what I realized is even though I had an intellectual knowledge that yes, Jesus died for me, yes, he loves me, I didn't fully believe it in my heart. And I needed that truth revealed to me through the Holy Spirit. I needed the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, we need to be on a daily basis. God, I need the Holy Spirit. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need that living water that you can give. Jesus, I need a lot of it because my heart is hard. And I need a deep watering, Lord. I need a deep watering of your love, of your Holy Spirit, God, and of your truth. So this verse, if we believe that God's word is true, says that God makes everything beautiful in his time, and that we don't know the work that he does from beginning to end. We don't know what he's doing, what he did 10 years ago in our life, what he was working then, what he's working today, and what he's working next year or the year after. God is working in your life. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Go to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. until the day of 
Jesus Christ. Brothers, if there's anything that you can take away from this, if there's at least one thing that you can take away from this sermon, is just believe what God has said about you. When we believe, that's like water to our soul. When we believe the word of God and its truth, we can hold on to that. And Jesus is right there holding on to us in his word. That's his water to our soul. It's a gift that he's given us. It's a gift. The word of God is a gift. And the Holy Spirit is alive through it. We've seen it in the word of God. And it can take the soil of our hearts, that dark, crusty, dry soil that is maybe a little bit light, maybe no life, whatever it may be. God can bring it to life. Amen. Exactly what he's doing. Amen. And the amazing thing is if we believe the word of God, he says he will carry it on. We can have confidence of this. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to come to a close. And you know what? Um, I really believe that no sermon should ever, no one says this, no sermon should ever be preached without some kind of some kind of a call for decision, for decision. And you know, when we, not, maybe not all times, but uh, most of the time, at least for me, when I'm trying to, when I think about something to write, a sermon or something to talk about, I'm really speaking to my own heart. I really am. Um, so I'll tell you, you know what I really need today? What, what I would need for somebody to say to me? Say, Matt, do you want to hold on to me if God was going to call my heart? want to choose to believe my word. And not only that, will you read my word? Will you hold on to me in my word? Will you let the water wash over your heart that I have to give you? All we have to do is ask and come to him. Spend time with Jesus on your knees in prayer. Is that your decision today? Amen. Dear Heavenly Father God, Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord, to share, Lord, lessons that you've given us in creation, in nature, Lord, uh, truth in your word, God. I just ask that you would help us to truly believe that your word is true, Lord God. Every single little verse is true, Lord, and let it be watered to our hearts, Lord. Let it be watered to our souls. Help us, Lord, to have confidence in you. And that assured, Lord, of what you have said to us, Lord, that you would not leave us or forsake us. God, that you are always working in our heart, Lord. You have been working in our heart and in our life. That you have been preparing the soil of our hearts, Lord. And you have been making it ready to receive your truth. That you have been making it ready to grow beautiful plants, Lord God, that would bear wonderful fruit. And, uh, we ask for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit, Lord. We ask for showers, Lord God. We ask that it would give us deep, deep, deep water, Lord God, of our hearts. And Lord, I just ask that uh, we would always remember, Lord. We would always think about you, Lord God. And not uh, forget, Lord, your importance. Spending time and in the word. And Lord, we ask all these things in the name.